With the majority of young people these days who graduate from school going on to universities, the campus experience is increasingly common part of our culture. Historically, it was an elite experience. And when we think about the notion of the campus itself, although it's several hundred years old and dates back to the explicit design of the uh, University of Virginia campus site by Thomas Jefferson and his collaborators, uh, we think much more broadly in terms of the campus experience, which has antecedents of hundreds, indeed thousands of years. What's particularly interesting is these days, a whole bunch of other organizations want to embrace the notion of the campus. Perhaps that's because people themselves have very positive associations of their student days. Perhaps it's just simply too, because those free flowing collaborations uh, that lead to so much knowledge creation and often lifelong positive friendships, collaborations, networks between students are really the ideal model for so many enterprises in post-industrial capitalism. Well, let's turn anyway to a bit of an exploration of the uh, notion of the campus and see how it's evolved. And let's think a little bit about some of the contemporary demands that are being made on the university as an institution, and particularly how people want to use the campus as a catalyst for achieving a whole range of other economic and social goals. Uh, historically, of course, the image of the medieval university was of a cloistered space. Uh, it had a very distinct spatial and material heritage, as I say here. The medi medieval universities became the model, fundamental model, for the notion of putting people together in close proximity to simultaneously create new knowledge and to transmit knowledge to a younger generation, students, that that knowledge would be an accumulation of the wisdom of the past and contemporary research that was very much future oriented. So the university has always been looking backwards to look forwards and sometimes in a very uh, uneasy relationship with key stakeholders in its own contemporary times. Uh, one thing we can say for sure is that with the rapid expansion of uh, higher education in the late 19th century and then after World War II as well, uh, a common reference point were the medieval universities such as Oxford and Cambridge. In the late 19th century, partly because uh, there was a, a neo-Gothic revival which had, had taken hold, first of all, with the arts and craft movement in uh, England anyway, there was a very strong referencing of the architecture of the uh, great medieval universities in building new university campuses. This actually was happening right in Oxford and Cambridge itself too. In some of the newer colleges, they often styled themselves on their medieval um, antecedents. Here is Sel Selwyn College, is much older at Cambridge, uh, but clearly has uh, what we associate with the uh, the uh, classic medieval image of Oxford and Cambridge. Now, when uh, universities were first established in European colonies, such as New South Wales, this is the University of Sydney, um, it was no surprise that they referenced the uh, architectural styles that they were familiar with and aspired to with Oxford and Cambridge. Very often the materiality took on a slightly different form this is built with very distinctive sandstone, which is a feature of so much of the older architecture in Sydney, which just simply re reflected the available stone um, at the time. And universities, of course, that have these uh, legacy uh, architectures have had a certain branding advantage. Uh, indeed, we often talk about the, uh, the group of eight universities uh, in Australia with the general reference to the sandstone institutions, although not all, not all of them are, are in fact sandstone institutions. Um, but Sydney and uh, University of Queensland, for example, certainly do have that advantage. But all of these older, more prestigious universities have also tended to continue to attract very substantial resources for their ongoing development. So the evolution of the campus itself has been um, always a bit of a struggle to reconcile its... Uh, built materiality and the forms, uh, the, the legacy forms of its architecture with its uh, contemporary campus expansion. So we see many variants uh, on the theme of, of borrowing the uh, European campus forms. This is the University of Western Australia, for example. Um, 
But we also see that the uh, universities themselves, the campus uh, environment is very much uh, a function of its times. Uh, not everything is built just in a um, what historical, historicist style. So that at certain junctures, the, uh, the architecture, of course, has mirrored what is um, fashionable trending in broader society. Um, given that so many higher ed education institutions grew very rapidly after World War II, with substantial expansion of participation in universities, also with more government recognition uh, of the emergence of knowledge economies, and a recognition that competitive advantage would flow to societies through expanding their higher education systems, we see a lot of both public money and private money going into expanding higher education participation and therefore building the campus to accommodate that. So if you go onto many university campuses that expanded rapidly through the 1950s and 1970s, you'll see that a lot of the architecture has very much um, a distinctive mid-century modernist um, styling. And one of the interesting things is when I was a university student, for example, people were again sentimental for older architecture and sort of saw some of the buildings of the 50s and 60s and 70s as a little bit of an embarrassment. Um, nowadays, of course, we have a much greater appreciation of the, uh, the beauty of a lot of modernist forms. And so there's been a lot of uh, refreshing of um, architecture that was associated with that high growth period and uh, they themselves have become sig uh, significant signature features of the University campus. The University of Sydney, for example, is a classic example, um, major library, Fisher Library here, and uh, with obviously a very striking, striking modernist building there. And um, in a similar vein, University of Western Australia, with its, its central library, and uh, the view from the veranda, and inside, uh, if we had to uh, generalise about trends in campus architecture and look at what's, what's uh, the, the dominant aesthetic these days and for the last 10 years in universities, it's very much a turn to transparency, to glass. Uh, partly the university itself feels a certain uh, pressure to be more open to the community at large partly wants to showcase what's going on in within its its own campus, within its buildings, and so our, our glass itself becomes uh, a desirable thing to have. We have a much greater celebration, of course, of, of, of light and letting the light in and expansive horizons. Um, as campuses themselves have been very focused on being um, centres of... of, of um, both social life and beauty in terms of, of creating a beautiful campus environment. Obviously glass uh, is a very desirable uh, materiality so that people can you know, um, engage with both uh, the outer uh, experience, so the, out, the outside campus experience, as, as, as well as of course be in the building and uh, be observed by uh, others as well. So we can say uh, there has been overall, overall a general shift from stone through concrete uh, to glass as a preferred materiality of the university campus. Uh, this is a fairly recent building at the uh, University of Sydney, for instance. Um, architecture itself, the, uh, the building of the university campus uh, has uh, increasingly come to be seen as not just serving the function imper imperative, of course, of having to uh, accommodate all the functions of the university, the teaching and the research, or the symbolic imperatives that architecture has always had, uh, but also architecture is seen to be uh, an enabler of some of the, uh, the most desirable strategic goals of the university, uh, wanting to achieve a uh, very we say agile teaching here, much more flexible approach to disciplinary boundaries, uh, to be able to respond uh, more speedily in an innovative kind of way to changes in demands from society for um, particular fields of knowledge to be, uh, to be taught, communicated, uh, to be able to adjust to changing strategic imperatives at the university, for example, uh, to fundamentally change the, uh, the learning style of the university. Historically, it was very much a one-way transmission of knowledge, um, particularly at the undergraduate level, from uh, 
teaching staff to undergraduates and then t simply testing them on whether they had mastered that knowledge and sending them out into the world at large. Of course, uh, graduate education, particularly research-based training, has always been more interactive, but that's always been very small scale, kind of one-on-one, -on -one on either in a laboratory or, or say, for example, the PhD supervisor and a student. Um, but there's greater emphasis uh, in an era when, of course, um, like you're doing now, you can watch content um, directly online. Uh, you don't necessarily have to be on a university campus. So if you're going to be on the campus, uh, to actually try and flip the learning environment, to have greater emphasis on active learning by students themselves, to be interacting with each other, with faculty members. Uh, and this is also, uh, to a significant degree, in terms of building habits for students in terms of lifelong learning. That the proactive, student-initiated uh, learning endeavours are considered to be key graduate attributes uh, going out into a rapidly changing labour market world where technology and uh, so much in terms of business practices, governance practices, all of these things are changing significantly. And so people need to be able to have the capability to continue to update, continuously update in a very uh, proactive way uh, to uh, embrace new learning opportunities and whatnot. And of course, the collaborative dimension is, is hugely important. We've always understood that what, was, what made universities so interesting was, of course, so many people could come in a very uh, open way, could communicate without some of the, uh, the boundaries and social constraints that society as a whole might impose. So it was a, uh, a space very often where people could um, interact, catalyze, um, thinking, in, uh, innovation, um, form, um, friendships, associations that could lead to new research, new, new ideas development, or people who just simply became friends at university and became entrepreneurial and went on and created a, a company, for example. So lots of innovation coming out of the, uh, the free-flowing dynamics of the university environment. And so there's thinking about how architecture can actually catalyze all of these things. So we see that more and more universities are explicitly making um, these kind of dynamics one of their strategic goals and seeing architecture as an enabler of that. University of Sydney, for example, here, it obviously it couches its, terms, it, it, its goals in terms of leadership, so many of the prestigious universities do, leading to the question of who's, well, so maybe we need some universities that focus on very good followership. Um, leadership's kind of overdone. Uh, unless we have this very expansive notion that everyone can lead in some respect. But they say leadership for good starts here, uh, but they're talking obviously about nice accommodating spaces, naturally illuminated atrium, let the light in. Partly this is an environmental imperative, but partly just simply because we, uh, we like light these days, okay? Um, and this notion of designing to design buildings to cultivate connection and informal learning is a critical point here that the formal learning, of course, the universities have always done, uh, but that's also more easily enabled with technology. And uh, we need to think more and more about how the university can enable the most positive um, boundary expanding, informal learning, creative collaborations. And of course, a big emphasis on activity-based um, working. Uh, so another aspect of simple campus design is to try and make these more attractive places for people to come and spend time. One of the uh, fundamental challenges for universities these days is as we make more and more stuff available online, uh, we run the danger that students actually won't bother coming to the university at all. So people want to be university students. Um, and even if they do very much aspire to being on campus regularly and having these, these um, very fluid and positive and uh, interactions between diverse people and expanding their own horizons, getting getting to make interesting friends and um, engage in new collaborations. In the end, people sleep in uh, a bit too late. They get up a bit too late and they think, oh, I'm not going to make my class on time. That's no, okay because it's streamed or it's recorded or whatever. And so in the end, people don't leave their bedroom and they end up experiencing a significant proportion of their learning um, through stuff that's been stored online for them and they never actually get around to getting, getting onto the campus, even though ideally, um, personally, they would like to spend more time there. 
So to some degree, it's really just about uh, trying to boost student motivation to actually come onto campus in the first place and keep, keep these positive dynamics going that we so much associate with the positive experience of the campus. Um, there's another emphasis as well too, increasing with universities on experiential learning, okay? Rather than just having things described to you or presented to you, um, that people are directly involved in things such as making or experimentation, all those things which have, you know, make design schools and um, the science is actually uh, historically quite attractive on universities, uh, but has been less the case for um, humanities, for example. So we see in a whole range of fields a very strong emphasis on um, experiential learning on campus and as we say here we see here agile teaching spaces um, and whatnot. So we can think of the campus as a site for communication where increasingly the universities themselves are trying to reimagine the spatiality of the institutions to better catalyze that communication. So to really foreground it. So we see, for example, um, this is just the University of Western Australia, recognising that um, the old notion of the, uh, the library where it was just a collection of books and corrals where individuals sat there in perfect silence didn't actually reflect how uh, people want to um, use a library space these days. That actually what people are looking to do is to have little breakout rooms to work on group projects or just to have informal conversations with people. So we see the UWA here has created these um, um, interesting uh, quasi-private spaces in significant parts of the, uh, the library there so people can um, cluster quite easily without disturbing others uh, in a very uh, fluid kind of way. And uh, my uh, undergraduate and master's experience was at the University of Queensland and I used to go to the Central Library. It was always deathly quiet. It was, it was good to work when I really needed to concentrate, but uh, there was absolutely no question of having chats with other people, for example. And uh, yes, it was those just those typical rows of books and then the corrals at the end. Um, and it could be a bit of a lonely, bit of a dismal place um, at times. Um, good if you wanted to concentrate, but other than that, um, arguably depressive. And when I was on the campus, the last time I was able to get back there, just before the whole COVID um, chaos. Uh, it was very striking uh, back in 2019, September 2019, uh, that the uh, the university was really remaking the uh, the key central library there uh, to create so many more spaces where students could fluidly uh, fluidly interact. I'm not quite sure about the purple. <laughs> it's almost got a bit of a kind of a dodgy nightclub kind of feel to it, uh, but purple is part of the color scheme of the uh, the university, and so they're kind of working with that there. Um, what I want to do uh, for the rest of the presentation here is to look at uh, several particular examples to draw out some broader themes. Um, and as I've already said, universities are more and more trying to catalyze uh, new conversations across old boundaries, whether they're psychological boundaries or organizational boundaries. Uh, just simply bringing people together who wouldn't normally be interact with each other, interacting with each other, whether it's the professors themselves, research students, undergraduate students, um, try and bringing different perspectives uh, and people with different outlooks, uh, different values, different experiences uh, together into creative conversations. Alto University in Helsinki is one institution that uh, is reflecting a whole range of strategic innovations, partly to achieve these goals, but also like a number of other institutions, and I'll, and I'll highlight several more, uh, also are seen as having a broader strategic benefit for the nation as a whole. Alto University actually came about in recent years through a merger of three very good institutions. And um, its naming is inspired by Alvar Aalto, the uh, uh, renowned Finnish modernist architect and furniture designer. And one of the campuses and where Al um, Aalto University is being concentrated on uh, had a significant part of its um, early design done by Alvar Aalto 
um, himself. Okay, so uh, I was very fortunate, very privileged to visit the uh, the business school at um, Alto University, and uh, they were downtown um, in a quite nice old building, a quite story building. But in uh, with the putting of the institutions together and uh, the concentration on a more suburban campus um, on the outskirts of Helsinki, but in a very beautiful place, uh, it had been decided to move the business faculty, um, not just out to the campus there, but to effectively co-locate it uh, with the design uh, school, which is a very uh, interesting uh, dynamic. So this is the downtown campus. Um, but um, briefly, let's take note of Alvaralto. Um, some of you will recognize uh, straight away some of his furniture designs and whatnot. Uh, with his uh, first wife, Anna Aino Alto, uh, he did some very iconic both furniture and um, vase and uh, so many other um, product designs as well as architecture. Unfortunately, his, his first wife um, tragically died quite early from cancer. Um, later on, he was to remarry. Uh, and married an architect and continued to do um, uh, in, a, in a collaborative fashion uh, some of the most um, celebrated uh, post-war modernist architecture um, from uh, Finland. So this is actually in the uh, the library at Aalto University and um, in one corner of the uh, the central part of the library they have um, gathered together a whole bunch of books about Alvar Aalto himself. So clearly um, Clearly, a lot of people are actually drawn to go to um, Finland, to Helsinki, and into the university by a particular interest um, in uh, the work of him, and other people are very much inspired by him. So, he is, in a, in a sense, the, the signature Finnish architect uh, designer, and so it made a lot of strategic sense for the institution to... Um, the newly formed institution from putting these three universities together to embrace uh, his name. Uh, but he himself uh, was very comfortable spanning borders, boundaries. He uh, spent a lot of time in uh, other countries, particularly in the Mediterranean, for example. Uh, he comfortably crossed over between architecture, furniture, other product design. And so many of his attributes, including his uh, very egalitarian uh, approach to design. He did many very famous works uh, for public institutions, including for workers' collectives, for example, including one very very striking building that was built uh, literally by volunteers themselves. So it wasn't just architecture and design for the wealthy, it was really for society as a whole and a very strong social democratic vein. So in so many ways, at what Alto embodied made a lot of sense to um, to build the university identity identity around it. Well, the uh, the particular campus site uh, it was decided in uh, back in about uh, 2012 2013 that there would be some consolidation of the institution um, out on the uh, um, campus um, in the suburbs. Uh, this is a very famous building, uh, part of the original campus that Alto himself had designed, and. Uh, he was interesting in that he's very much a modernist, but he also used uh, a lot of uh, local familiar building materials such as brick. And uh, we'll see that uh, when the campus was substantially expanded in the last few years, uh, in order to give a, a degree of coherence through the campus, this signature building material is also integrated here. Now, this looks kind of innocuous. This is it's obviously it's a very nice structure, structure and the, uh, the form of the building is, is, has become quite symbolic. Um, these are the original plans uh, or model that was, that was created for, for the, uh, the building and the campus development when it was first designed by Alto. You can see that on display there. Okay. And uh, get up nice and close and have a look. Uh, you might recognize straight away some of the uh, the furniture that he was associated with. This is this is actually in the uh, the lecture hall here, um, in the space in front of uh, what I'll show in a second. Uh, to my mind, the most beautiful lecture spaces I've um, ever seen and probably will ever see. So again, this is the uh, before one enters the uh, the lecture rooms, and this is where you go in. And so these are the uh, uh, the lecture halls. Uh, 
you can very clearly see the uh, the striking modernist ele uh, elements here. Uh, many designers, uh, for example, Fuxao Nalto, uh, when he was invited to the University of uh, Alto University to to give a lecture, he gave a lecture explicitly in here. Of course, designers like to be in this space. Um, so uh, with great sculptural beauty and very effective use of light. Uh, this is the, uh, the library of the campus, which was designed by him as well. So the decision to move the business faculty out to this suburban campus, uh, people could see the potential, but to take a business faculty out of the downtown uh, centre of, of, of a city such as Helsinki and then move it to the suburbs um, causes some consternation for the business academics. They, they like to be close to where the headquarters of so many companies are, to the, to the centre of finance and whatnot. So sending them out to the, uh, the campus in, at um, Otaniemi uh, was somewhat disconcerting. They could see the strategic potential, the rationale, and uh, of course there was a, a certain sentimentality about leaving the, uh, the buildings that they uh, knew so well, knew so well, very storied in uh, downtown Helsinki. But the consultation process, one of the things that really struck me was the incredible op openness of the University of Alto to this. They were there, they were, I was involved. Um, all of a sudden I invited myself along effectively and they gave me a very warm welcome and I was able to talk with some of their um, um, very senior university leaders. In fact, they invited me to their um, start of semester um, reception party, which was a wonderful, wonderful evening. And were incredibly generous with their uh, insights about their strategic intent. And uh, I was struck by, by the sheer culture of openness um, in the Finnish context, context in higher education, in this particular institution as well. But that this also carried over very much to making sure that all the stakeholders in the development of the new campus were involved. Uh, this was a nice thing I just happened to see. Dear architects, these are our wishes for the new business campus. So they had these up in several spots and uh, effectively staff members, students were free to put notes there, uh, sending messages uh, to the designers of the campus they were going to be moving to. So this is effectively um, what's ended up. So a substantial uh, additional building project out on the suburban campus uh, to bring business and architecture and uh, design um, and other parts of the institution all together in a very significant new cluster of buildings which complemented the existing structure. And then there's a third stage as well where they're, uh, they're further expanding the campus by renovating some buildings. And I was fortunate to uh, visit uh, when construction was underway with this. So and this is uh, the uh, when I was there. So the construction process um, happening. Now, uh, I've taken this directly from Alto's website uh, in the Vario area there. What they're explicitly were doing was to bring together um, schools of arts, design and architecture along with business and to put them close together in a way that's just not um, normally done in universities, um, looking to pr uh, promote new interesting collaborations. And uh, this is an architectural model from how they imagined um, creating a new cluster of um, buildings and spaces. And uh, again, the model with construction happening in the background. And more construction at the time. Furthermore, in the first shot we saw is uh, this being completed. And as I said, the, uh, the brickwork, this is, this is the original library that was design, designed by Alto, uh, but the, uh, the signature materiality here was brought as a uh, part of the visual identity to the uh, new uh, development of the campus. So in their own description here, they say traditionally university campuses have been divided into different buildings according to school. Alto campus facilities have instead been divided according to the emphasis of research to better support multidisciplinary cooperation. 
and they're looking to uh, promote a whole range of collaborations, both at the undergraduate student level and at the research level. And uh, this is how it's all evolved um, in a uh, very effective, uh, coherent way. And the surrounding area uh, is a significant business park initiative. So a lot of creative industries, research institutes and whatnot are explicitly encouraged, given incentives by the city and national government as well, uh, to co-locate and to build collaborative partnerships with the university. And also very high quality housing developments, new railway connections, uh, and all the rest of it. So trying to catalyze, partly perhaps um, with a little bit of the Silicon Valley, uh, Stanford dynamic, uh, informing the vision, but also very much uh, to further catalyze what's already been a um, very positive set of collaborative developments uh, between uh, existing businesses and the university. But also we need to notice that um, Finland has some of the highest uh, rates of new enterprise uh, creation of startup establishments. Some of you may have heard of Slush, for example, which is an interesting um, new business uh, venture, effectively a pitch um, uh, event. Well, it's much bigger than that. It's a conference as well. And in fact, the, until COVID, they were doing Slush in Tokyo as well. Uh, this was an originally started uh, by uh, Alto students, business students, for instance. So in uh, their own description of what they've done with the new building space, they've set out, this sounds kind of like what Sydney University is talking about, right? Uh, adaptable and flexible learning spaces arranged around skylit atriums. What's very interesting here is they have foregrounded something which is a recent turn in a number of universities and I'll wave something at the camera here. Um, for instance, this, the Institute of Making, which is actually at UCL, University College London, for example. Um, workshops are on the ground floor, meeting areas and project spaces uh, above. So you've got the architecture and design uh, school located right next to the business programs and uh, they have uh, put all of the making explicitly on display, completely wrapped it in glass, that transparency of glass, that wonderful transparency of glass. And even if you're a business student, you study marketing or something, you're looking through and thinking, oh, I wanna go and make something. I wanna get, I wanna get a little bit tactile. I wanna do something interesting. Or look at all those design people who work in there. Aren't they, aren't they the most funky, interesting looking people on campus? I've really gotta know them. I want, um, I want some friends like that. Okay, uh, so this inevitably is just going to foster mutual enthusiasm. And if it brings about a little bit of design and maker envy in some of the, uh, the first year business students, that's a perfect outcome. Uh, then there's a whole bunch of learning opportunities. There are courses that students can take from either side of the, uh, the program, for example, uh, lots of collaborative opportunities. And we can see that uh, despite the, there being some like 50 years um, distance between the original buildings and more contemporary ones, um, through the, uh, the use of the signature brick, for example, they were able to um, uh, bring together a cohering visual identity. And uh, then the, uh, there's a, another stage of development using some of the older buildings um, down on the, uh, the lakeside there. And... Uh, Re rebuild, reworking some of the buildings, um, very much focused on uh, bringing corporate partners um, closer into the campus, particularly centered on, on design, innovation and whatnot. Uh, so really to try and make it a creative cauldron right there on, on the campus. So this is uh, a particularly innovative instance uh, it's not entirely surprising, though, that this is happening in a place like Finland. And we can say more generally that the Nordics um, have had uh, for many decades a very strong emphasis on architecture serving uh, the social good. Partly there's a, there's a social democratic tradition, but there's also since uh, well before World War II, since um, early in the 20th century, a very strong emphasis on uh, the power of design to make uh, a better life for people, but also to make a stronger economy. And the Danes and Denmark really led the world on this um, in the early 20th century in emphasizing 
the good product design, uh, for instance, would allow products to be priced at a higher price. Therefore, companies that were making the products could pay workers um, higher wages, higher salaries, and people would have a, a better standard of living. So effectively, good design on the economic side, on, on the, the product, productive side of the economy, as well as an architecture of the everyday, quite literally, in terms of infrastructure and the built environment. Uh, so we see, for example, in Copenhagen, uh, this is the Danish Architecture Centre, and this was an a, uh, influential exhibition. They had the right to space, uh, which was actually mirroring a theme um, that uh, the Danes had uh, exhibited under at the Venice Biennale, um, explaining uh, the uh, very vibrant renaissance in um, Danish architecture. The most prominent instance being the, uh, the Danish architectural firm Big, which we'll see in the conclusion to this presentation, uh, has done um, both the first and second developments of the Google campus um, in Silicon Valley. So a key thing that the Danes have long emphasized is this, this notion of the right to space, the art of the many, that uh, design serves everybody, not just the wealthy. And um, similarly, education must do this too. So bringing design and education together, both in terms of the content, the approach of education, but also in terms of recognizing um, good design uh, principles applied to campus dynamics can uh, effectively catalyze uh, better learning outcomes, more desirable campus experiences, um, and in turn the universities have so much more to offer than uh, a range of corporate and other social partners. Uh, but also another aspect in terms of this, this notion of being for all um, and a sense of social mission is very much the openness of the institutions. Uh, this is, for example, the uh, library of the um, um, Royal Danish uh, Academy. Now, under that name, um, it's only been an institution since 2011, but it took three very prestigious institutions, the, uh, the Royal School of Architecture, uh, the Design School, and um, also the separate conservatory, the uh, traditional um, historical um, conservation technologies and whatnot, and have put the three of them together. Um, uh, and uh, it goes by the English acronym uh, K-A-A-D-K, and this absolutely gorgeous and extraordinarily well-stocked um, design library is completely open to all. You could turn up in Copenhagen as a tourist and head over there and make use of the library. As long as you behave yourself, it's not going to be an issue. And where is it? Well, it's right here, okay? And this is a way of leading into a uh, the final key thing that I want to talk about here in this presentation, and that is how society as a whole, um, in so many places, and particularly governments in particular, uh, governments in particular, particularly governments in particular, have recognised that the university offers a model of open collaboration that can catalyse broader social change, particularly uh, innovation that might have substantial benefits for the economy. But also the very nature of the campus itself, frankly, improves neighborhoods, okay? So what we're finding is that uh, governments all over the world, as I say here, increasingly harness the university um, to try and catalyze uh, creative cities um, or urban renewal policies or innovation hubs, for example. So this is Holman in uh, Copenhagen, and those three institutions put together to form KADK have been, uh, KADK has then been located here, and also then the National Conservatory of Music, um, the Theatre and Dance School, um, and actually the Film School and the Film Archive are all being located in the same area right next to each other. Now, Holman was the, an old naval base area, so these were all um, naval buildings, and uh, many other areas that were um, effectively along the waterfront, storage areas for um, gunboats, 
effectively arsenals of where weapons as well were stored have been uh, renovated and so many creative offices are moved in there so advertising agencies architectural firms under armor for example has a significant european design office based based there so they're down in a waterfront area um, revitalizing that area but much more than that hoping that by bringing so many uh, diverse uh, knowledge workers and creative workers together in one site uh, that new creative combinations will emerge and that in turn will be even more of a draw card for other companies to locate there and hopefully international companies. So Copenhagen is um, an extremely innovative place and although it has very high wages and high taxes and all the rest of it, uh, it is such a creative cauldron that uh, plenty of foreign companies would like to have a presence there. So I uh, want to switch to a different part of the world, um, but uh, a similar instance of where governments are trying to catalyze urban renewal. Um, and again, looking to the example of an Academy of Arts and Design, this is a Betzalel Academy, uh, the oldest uh, arts and design school in Israel, in fact, one of the oldest higher education institutions, um, arguably probably the oldest, um, institution in Israel, founded in uh, 1907, well before the state of Israel was established. Okay. And uh, a little bit of context. Um, Betzalel has been based in Jerusalem, but it has across several sites. It's um, up on uh, the main, main site is up on uh, Mount Scopus, um, which actually on one side looks across right across to Jordan and the, the West Bank, and on the other side looks um, right down over, over Jerusalem, the old city and a spectacular view, right next to Hebrew University of Jerusalem. But downtown in the original building, the architecture school is uh, separately located. Um, we need a little bit of context here where, um, where uh, Betzalel is uh, going to be relocating. It's actually going to be relocating smack bang um, in the middle of the administrative hub um, of Jerusalem, now right next to the town hall. And uh, this illustration here, this, this obviously dates back to 1868. Uh, this shows the old uh, the old city and the boundaries of the city. And um, up the top here is uh, what was uh, called the Russian compound. And uh, this is, uh, of course, all around it now is, part, is well and truly uh, thoroughly urbanized. And uh, this is effectively effectively where Betzalel Academy is going to be consolidated. And with um, the idea quite explicitly of um, nudging the uh, the direction of the city in a more kind of um, cosmopolitan uh, way. Uh, Jerusalem, of course, is um, historically very politically contested. Um, it was a divided city um, until the uh, Six Day War and uh, still is, is uh, um, occasionally tense, um, very strong um, Obviously, secular meaning. Uh, it's uh, as uh, particularly the um, Dome of the Rock and Al Aqsa Mosque uh, is the second most uh, sacred site um, for Muslims. Um, the uh, Temple Mount is far and away the most sacred, of course, for Jews. Originally built 2,000 years ago, and of course, Jerusalem is um, deeply sacred site uh, to Christians as well. And uh, the city itself has always been contentious precisely because uh, three major religions concentrate uh, claims upon it. Um, Tel Aviv, uh, down by the coast, uh, is the much more cosmopolitan, liberal city. Uh, but Jerusalem historically relatively was so too, particularly in the, uh, in the first half of the uh, 20th century, and has become, in some respects, more religious relative to Tel Aviv. So by encouraging the design school to be in the heart of the city, um, the idea that you're going to have a whole bunch of hipsters <laughs> in design school um, will help to reinforce the, uh, the more secular nature of the city. Now, this is a very storied site. And uh, I bring this example because there are several interesting things that we can learn here from this. Um, one of the things, of course, is that, as in so many other places, the university itself and the campus is being used to catalyze urban revitalization central to the city. And we'll see that's a 
been a bit of a probably problematic site. Um, so we get that. Also, the very nature of the design is uh, has a very strong motivation to allow people outsiders to engage more with the institution, but also to catalyze interactions within the institution as well. But there's also a complex set of issues uh, that universities themselves, where do they stand in relation to their host societies and with history and whatnot? And this is a particularly complicated one here because this site was developed um, by Russian pilgrims. And if we go back to here, uh, the Russian compound, uh, the reason why it was a compound in the first place was um, because large numbers of Russian Christian pilgrims in the late 19th century um, went to Jerusalem and they're often really badly treated and the Russian Tsar at the time um, and a lot of Russian don um, aristocratic donors uh, provided the resources to um, create this secure compound for the pilgrims to stay. And we see that church there, which is, is meaningful. Um, one of the most prominent and notorious figures in late Tsarist Russia, um, Rasputin, for example, spent time here in this particular site. Okay. So why is the site contentious? Well, there's so many things going on right next to it. Um, right next to the site, there is this, you know, where the, the architectures and architect, architecture and design school is to be. Um, you've got the, uh, the church we just saw there. Uh, you actually have the Jerusalem Regional Police Headquarters, um, and it's even more complicated than that. Actually, the, uh, the Shin Bet, the, uh, the Internal Secret Service, um, uh, with some of the, uh, the toughest approach to uh, law and order, um, have their interrogation cells right next to the site. Um, the City Hall also happens to be right nearby. Um, the magistrate's court are there. There's a, uh, a museum um, which used to be part of the Russian compound, but when the British were ruling Jerusalem in the interwar period had turned into a, um, a prison. And so when the Jewish underground were trying to push for um, uh, Jewish rule over Palestine, when the British left, um, a bunch of them were locked up there and some people were actually executed there. So messy set of issues okay this is where the uh, uh, the police and the courts and people waiting their turn for their trial or their family members to, to, to come out for example um, this is not a place you want to be you know, inside okay this is the uh, police um, and holding cells okay right next to the campus and this uh, all has an interesting Japan angle, which may um, kind of surprise you. But the, the, if you look to the left here, you'll see that that is City Hall. Um, this is the proposed building to go smack bang in the middle of the site, um, squeezed in into the middle of the old Russian compound, leaving the original historical buildings, effectively filling the, uh, the empty compound component. But the architects are none other than Sanaa. Um, uh, to celebrated uh, partners, uh, Nishizawa-san and Sejima-san, Japanese architects founded Sana, won the Pritzker Prize, the equivalent of the, the Nobel Prize for architecture, um, profoundly celebrated, in, internationally uh, very active architects, and they have brought a very distinctly Sana style building into this context. Okay, And uh, this is the vision of it. Um, very open, very transparent, uh, the kind of architecture, of course, we've just seen that um, is very much desirable for universities these days. Um, in the Jerusalem case, with uh, literally stretching right back to biblical times, a tradition of um, throwing stones, um, glass encased buildings, one would one would wonder, is that a good idea? And uh, there is there is literally a debate about that. Um, in terms of the heritage issues, uh, clearly it going, is going to be dropped smack bang in the middle of a compound. And so there are some separate issues beyond our concern here, um, but about the notion of, well, is, is a compound and a bounded space in itself um, of significant heritage uh, value? So we can think of it as actually an infill exercise here. And um, I have written a book chapter very specifically on these issues with Professor um, Arez Konali Solomon, and we've written several other things as well, which explore the heritage um, issues uh, with this site. Um, this is the, uh, the project underway.
so significant interventions. And uh, effectively, we see there there is a rendering of the building. This is this is this is a mock-up. Um, why why is this so significant? Well, because uh, one of the things that the British mandate rulers did in the uh, 1920s was to dictate that every single building that be built in Jerusalem must be faced with Jerusalem stone. It's given a real coherence to the city. But um, as we've seen. Uh, obviously, a more transparent materiality has become a desirable attribute um, in a lot of campus architecture. And also, Sana, um, transparency is their signature. Uh, this is a uh, rendering of the, uh, from back in 2015, of their um, project with the Art Gallery of New South Wales. So, so this is the, uh, the new Sydney um art um contemporary art building that will complement the existing art gallery of new south wales in a prime site and this is a little bit controversial itself um, but the thing with sanar is you know if you if you want to you need a new building but around the uh, site is uh, a fair degree of contention about whether for example views are going to be obstructed or should they be building at all then Sanaa is kind of the safe, the safe architect, architecture to have, precisely because it is so, so transparent. It brings a translucency, in a sense, um, to, to the building. So Sanaa were brought to Jerusalem uh, and ran into some very elementary problems about well, how, how do you actually meet the stone requirements and whatnot, and that's beyond our concern. Um, but, what, but fundamentally what we're saying here is that we have certain aspirations with institutions that run up against always the complexities of particular sites, uh, the political complexity, the, whether it's town planning issues in the Israeli context, the security concerns, for example. Um, but a building like, like this looks entirely unsurprising in a, um, in, say, an American or an Australian campus context, uh, but is a very radical intervention in the middle of Jerusalem. But this is also why they got the project too, because literally it's uh, about creating uh, a new set of relationships between the surrounding community and the institution. Okay, And uh, so literally here, uh, what is currently a barbed wire fence around the museum of the underground prisoners, for example, would come down and create a significant area of space for students to be able to flow um, around the uh, the university campus. So, and this is being built and it will be realized quite soon. So this will have a quite transformative impact on a central part of the city, uh, which has historically been quite contentious. So finally, I'd just like to note that the ideals of the campus have become so widely upheld and valued that some of the most valuable companies in the world today have styled themselves as not having HQs or offices, but actually having campuses. And the two you're most familiar with, of course, is um, Apple. Um, Apple's first major headquarters, which they occupied from 1993 up until 2017, at one infinite loop, you'll still see that address um, on your devices, okay, on the boxes that your devices come in. They explicitly referred to the head office there as the Apple campus, and it was styled very much as a university campus, um, and taking some cues from Stanford in particular, um, which of course they're in a, a very close relationship with because of the Silicon Valley dynamic. Now, uh, I think most of you know that um, they've dropped over $5 billion um, on a uh, uh, Foster's and Partners. Uh, it's a very uh, renowned um, architectural firm from London, um, established by Norman Foster. And um, this, through the whole development, was referred to as Apple Campus 2. Uh, not surprising given, given obviously, its um, setting and uh, in environmental concerns. Um, with its completion, they renamed it the uh, Apple Park. That's not to say that the, uh, the style in a styling of a corporate headquarters as a campus has fallen out of favor. Um, in fact, the very opposite, uh, Google's headquarters um, at Mountain View, uh, designed by Big, the Danish architectural firm, 
uh, and which so many people go to visit. They explicitly refer to it as the campus, and in fact their second campus, not far away, also developed by Big, um, they're also explicitly referring to uh, as a campus. And many other companies are doing this. It's not just simply um, IT firms based in Silicon Valley. Uh, Novartis, for example, one of the, uh, the world's largest pharmaceutical firms based in Basel in Switzerland, um, explicitly talk about their campus. And we see some of the imaging here of new buildings that they are creating. And one needs only to Google um, why are so many company head offices called campuses these days uh, to realize that there is a very vibrant conversation about this and why so many companies are buying into the ideals of the campus. Um, one of the interesting ironies of that is that the universities themselves um, have been so made of it, motivated to try and rethink their campuses because they fear that the students um, just won't get out of bed um, and make an effort to drag themselves to the campus anymore. But employees, uh, on the other hand, from, from a corporate perspective, uh, it's believed that unless it's kind of more campus-like rather than head office-like, um, employees are not going to be satisfied. So I think there is a kind of a mutual um, exchange of ideas here. And also particularly that uh, universities themselves, partly under pressure from key stakeholders such as governments, uh, partly because I know it's just a really good thing to do, are looking to have much more closer collaborations with uh, some of the most dynamic corporate entities out there. And so the, uh, the very notion of the open campus as a collaborative space uh, is something that's attractive to corporates, is considered to be one of the greatest strengths of the university. And so we're seeing more and more um, with that particular instance, for example, of Alto, of very deliberately um, consolidating the university, the different parts of the university on a site that, that catalyzes conversations internally, but which is already uh, as well from the beginning designed to be open to um, outside stakeholders who can come and co-locate next to the university or right on the university itself. So uh, although many of you may be wondering if COVID marks the uh, the end of the primacy of the notion of the campus, I think more than anything, uh, precisely because we can be so virtually and digitally connected, the best parts of the of the uh, the campus experience and campus dynamic is something that not just the universities want to hang on to and further promote, but that every company, every organization trying to make sense of physical space and bringing people together in a physical space are informed by the vision of the campus dynamic.